when gold recovers, it really recovers, but it always tests your faith and tests your patience. Hi, my name is Georgia Tucker with Cambridge House. Today I'm talking with resource investing legend Rick Rule and the CEO of EMX Realty Corp, David Cole. David's had an impressive 30 year career, including management roles with leader Numa Mining. We'll be talking about the current gold bull market, the economy, and why the royalty model might be offering investors the best returns. For more investing insights from Cambridge House, follow us at Cambridge on Twitter or click the link in the pinned comment below to receive our weekly newsletter. If you enjoy the video, which I hope you do, please hit like and subscribe. Thanks and enjoy. Welcome, Rick Rule, David Cole. Pleasure to have you both uh, with me today. Exciting times for investors, so let's just jump right in. Rick, fair to say we're in a gold bull market now. Uh, in your own words, how do we not waste this one? <laughs> well, the, the first thing, I think there's two things to understand. Um, the first is that if we look at the eight prior recoveries in precious metals from oversold bottoms, uh, it's, pretty er it's pretty obvious that we're in the early innings of this. So don't check out too soon. The chart that I discussed the last time that you interviewed me, the Barron's Gold Mining Index chart, showed that in eight prior recoveries over 40 years from oversold bottoms, the most tepid recovery for the index, not the best stock, but the index, was 180% from trough to peak. And the best recovery was 1,200%. By most estimations, we're up about 25 or 30 percent from the uh, indexes. So there's more to come. The second thing, though, in uh, sort of unpacking that chart, is that bull markets, but particularly precious metals bull markets, are volatile. It is easy, easy in a bull market to see a 15 percent retrenchment, a 20 percent retrenchment, even a 50 percent retrenchment. My first bull market in the 1970s saw gold go from $35 an ounce to $200 an ounce. Nice move. Of course, that move attracted lots of people who were going to be faithful to the metal forever. Then in nine months, the metal fell by 50% from 200 to 100. People wished they didn't know how to spell gold, sold out at the bottom, and watched gold go from 100 to 850 in five short years. So the message, I think, is that the wind is in gold sales. When gold recovers, it really recovers, but it always tests your faith and tests your patience. Remember those, th those three things and you'll do well. Excellent. Absolutely. Uh, is this the real deal, though, or is this just a byproduct of the pandemic panic? I think this has nothing to do with the pandemic. Well, it does have to do with a pandemic. It has to do with the worst virus in human history, which is government. Um, the move that you're seeing in the gold price is a function of the fact that people are beginning to lose faith in the purchasing power of their savings, denominated elsewhere. Quantitative easing. We've talked about this before, Georgia. If you did it, they'd call it counterfeiting, and they would put your gorgeous self in prison. <laughs> when they do it, it's policy, and they get more, more votes. Artificially low interest rates. Uh, of course, that erodes faith in the purchasing power of your dollar because they pay you less to store them. And then, of course, debt and deficits. The creditor associated with Canadian government securities, or worse, U.S. government securities, is broke. The balance sheet and the income statement defies anybody to understand math and still buy them. Finally, precious metals are under-owned. Precious metals and precious metals related uh, investments comprise less than one half of 1% of all savings and investments in the United States. The three decade long mean is between one and a half and 2%. If the factors that we talked about, debt and deficits, quantitative easing, artificially low interest rates, those pieces of wind in gold sales don't cause the market share of gold just to reach the three decade mean, I'll be very surprised. Interesting. Uh, question for you both then. We saw $1,800 gold this week, 8.5 year high. Uh, let's start with you, David. What do you think, where's the ceiling here? Well, that's simply asking how bad can the US dollar get? 
um, because it's the antithesis to the U.S. dollar. Uh, I don't know where the ceiling is, uh, but my recommendation is to buy the dips. Gotcha. Rick? Uh, similarly, I'm uh, old enough that I'm too smart to answer a specific question like that, either with regards to target or time. Uh, I, I can simply tell you that if I have my choice uh, between Trump's dream, Biden's dream, or gold, I'm more comfortable with gold. Gotcha. Well, uh, that leads nicely into my next question. You both live in the U.S., and of course, it's an election year. Will the election have an effect on gold price, Rick? I think it'll have a psychological impact. Uh, I really believe that whether Tweedledum or Tweedledumer, and by the way, they're interchangeable, gets elected, that their prescription for the economy will be more of the same. Republicans will steal on behalf of Republicans. Democrats will steal on behalf of Democrats. And both of them will steal from the unborn who can't vote which is to say that there will be more quantitative easing, there will be more artificially low interest rates, there will be more debt, and there will be higher deficits. Uh, so your choice is Tweedledum or Tweedledumer. Uh, which candidate you assign which moniker to, I think depends on which warring tribe you're from. Neither make much difference to the outlook for gold. There it is. And David, what do you think? Well, elections are advanced auctions of stolen property. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, we have seen in the recent past during the COVID situation where the two major parties in the United States were arguing over who gets to give away more money to who. And all of that is negative for the currency. Rick, I've heard you say recently that investors need a business plan just like a company needs a business plan. And so often they come to the issuer for their investing business plan. So what should the retail plan look like? Perhaps you can name three rules or parameters retail investors should integrate into their plan. Well, the first thing is I would always suggest that people invest before they speculate. Mm. Now, I didn't do that, of course. Uh, all the money that I make now all the money that I invest sensibly now, I made through wild speculation. Uh, but people can't count on being lucky as I was. So you need to invest before you speculate. Uh, you need to place some money with the expectation of getting reasonable returns back, the reasonable expectations. And then with the money that you can afford a greater loss of, you should speculate. That's the first thing. Um, but with regards to the quote uh, that uh, you're referring to. We often ask companies their business plan. Uh, what is in particular uh, the answer to the unanswered question, the most important development which might happen with regards to a company which would change its value. Investors need to make a plan with every single investment. Uh, if I was going to go out and buy uh, EMX royalty today, I would need to ask Davey several questions, which I look forward to doing later in this interview. And based on the answers that I got to those questions, I would need to make a plan. How long do I plan to hold the stock for? What is going to change with information with regards to EMX that will cause its value to escalate? What might be a range of fair values? How might I know if my expectations are right or wrong? What would cause me to sell the stock? Mm -hmm. The nature of speculations is that you endure many 25 or 30 percent losses on your way to that one that gives you thousand percent gains. It is important to cut your losses when you're wrong, 25 percent or 30 percent, rather than letting your losses run so that you have less money to redeploy to those companies that can give you outstanding gains. Mm. It isn't important necessarily that if the circumstances around your speculation change, that your strategy doesn't change. You do need to change the strategy, but you absolutely have to have a strategy on the way in, or you are almost guaranteed loss in the absence of extraordinary luck. Good to know. A uh, question for you both. Uh, I've heard you both refer to silver as the poor man's gold, uh, but is silver losing its title as a precious metal? I was chatting to Ricky Fulp last week, and he thinks so. Uh, Dave, I'll start with you. Well, Mickey Fulp's quite the character. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, of course, it, you know, 
early in our careers, uh, silver was consumed repeatedly in the photographic process. Mm -hmm. And that's no longer the case as we've gone to digital photography. So that's been the big headwind for silver. And that has fundamentally changed the silver to gold ratio, in my opinion, uh, over time. That's been one of the larger contributors to that. But when you look at the actual price performance of silver, it's still very fascinating. It can lag gold for long periods of time and then completely outperform gold for short periods of time. And it, that comes back to this concept of the poor man's gold, uh, where when you do see a, a specific market event, then all of a sudden the price of silver can take off. So I wouldn't discount it entirely. And um, we could see a, a, a you know, a revision back towards silver gold ratios uh, closer to what we saw in the past because new uses of silver are forthcoming and it's uh, a simple use as a, as a poor man's gold or an alternative precious metal. Gotcha. Rick, what do you think? Silver still a precious metal? Absolutely. Dave's comments with regards to industrial uses are uh, accurate and prescient, in fact. Uh, I would only add that as a student of markets, uh, in the eight prior recoveries that I've lived through in my life, by recoveries, I'm not talking about my personal recovery, but rather uh, recovery in precious metals markets from oversold bottoms, silver has lagged gold every single time. Uh, gold moves first because it moves on fear. Gold do, needs to establish the momentum and the narrative for silver to move. And silver bugs are manic depressives, which is why silver moves so far. Silver bugs for at least the last five uh, recoveries where I've been a quote guru ha have been asking me in total despair, when will silver move? When will silver move? When will silver move? And my suspicion is that you're just now starting to see uh, silver move. Gold has established the momentum. The silver narrative is coming to the fore. Um, in this particular sense, I really do believe that past is prologue. It's important to note that in, in, in addition to the industrial applications, the sobriquet poor man's gold is important. Uh, rich people are, are more interested in protection. They come into the market first and they can afford the unit prices associated with gold. The lower unit prices of silver means that people who don't have the means that other people do uh, store their purchasing power, preserve their purchasing power in silver. I think it's also, uh, and this is a speculative point, this next one, it's important to note that the substitution of silver for gold has been particularly prevalent among very poor people, mm -hmm. South Asian people, Indian people, Pakistani people, Bengali people, Sri Lankan people. And in that, in that context, I'd like to suggest to you that the fact that the poorest 2 billion people on earth, although they're still desperately poor, have had their lot improved markedly in the last 30 years. Many of them now actually have something to save. And my suspicion is that the increased capability, economic capability of very poor people, and very poor people's access to information and communication via the web suggests that the next bull market in silver might be, I'm not saying will be, might be substantially stronger than people expect it to be simply because of the democratization on a global basis of access to financial products and financial information. Interesting. I had uh, never thought of it from that perspective. And let's talk a little bit more specifically about EMX now where you are the CEO. Um, can you explain to the viewers what the royalty model is for those that may not be familiar? Ah, well, the royalty model has actually evolved substantially over my career. And there's been some fantastic examples. We can go back to uh, Pierre Lassonde and starting Franco Nevada as one key example. I always like to, to, to go back and, um, and think about that. I was a geologist on the Carlin trend when Pierre Lassonde was, was uh, coming to visit properties that he had royalties on. He bought a royalty out of the Reno Gazette Journal for a little over a million dollars. And thanks to embedded optionality, which is one of the key aspects uh, that makes royalties so phenomenally interesting, uh, that royalty has now paid close to a billion dollars. Yeah. And, um, uh, but 
you know, royalties are, are fantastic financial instruments because they, of that embedded optionality, commodity price optionality, but, but more importantly is discovery optionality. And then other types of optionality that people oftentimes don't think about, and that would be the establishment of more infrastructure. Mm -hmm. the availability of uh, cheaper electricity, the advancement of metallurgical technologies, the advancement of engineering technologies, all of which are to the benefit of the royalty holder because it increases the resource in the ground, increases the reserve, increases production over time at no cost to the royalty holder. Mm -hmm. And it's those aspects of embedded um, optionality in the, uh, on the Carlin trend and some of the first royalties that Franco Nevada acquired would be preeminent examples of the combination of those optionalities all coming in to help them multiply and win in a huge way. And uh, so in a nutshell, um, in the early days, royalties uh, were created by prospectors that would sell their properties and keep a cut off the top of production in the future. But that has evolved now into a situation where the big royalty companies have become finance institutions and they're providing financing via royalties and streams, which are similar financial instruments, mm. to finance advancement of projects, it, whether that be into production or increased production, and there's even exploration royalty financing is going on now. So it's evolved over time as people have recognized that these are very dear financial instruments that folks love to own. Gotcha. And what is the difference between a royalty and a stream? So in a nutshell, um, royalties typically come right off the top and streams um, are, are a contract to purchase metal where there's a strike price involved. So for example, the byproduct silver from a copper mine can have a stream on it and someone has a contract to buy that silver at five bucks an ounce and so it has a strike price and there can be other contractual aspects to that deal as well. We have similar aspects and similar exposure to optionality, but they are different, uh, contractually different um, uh, vehicles. Right. And Rick, you don't invest exclusively in royalty companies, but why as an investor is it particularly appealing? Um, royalty and streaming companies generally have very, very, very good operating margins. Um, Franco Nevada's operating margin is hovering close to 90%, uh, which is to say that 90 cents out of every dollar that comes in comes home to mama and papa. Uh, in addition, uh, they don't have any sustaining capital investments or, or new capital investments, which is to say, once again, your gross is your net. Mm. Uh, there are no operational risks per se, other than uh, bankruptcy of the operator if you happen to be a stream holder. So they're good businesses. Uh, good businesses seem to attract good business people. When I look at the people who run uh, the top tier royalty and streaming companies and the mid tier companies, what I see is that uh, good businessmen and good businesswomen end up being attracted to good businesses. So the capital allocation decisions that are made tend to be better than the capital allocation decisions that are made by people who have chosen to um, populate less good businesses, which stands to reason. Uh, I, I was trying to figure out why in my mind there was an aggregation of intellectual capital, superior intellectual capital, both in the oil and gas and mining business, in the royalty and streaming part of the business relative to the rest. And then it struck me, the simplest of all answers, smart people are attracted to easy tasks, not hard tasks. And so the idea that you have better people involved in a better business is a pretty simple, um, pretty simple reason to be there. Simple as that. I said the global pandemic has made us all appreciate security a little more, I feel. So you've got assets all over the world. Do you feel as though safe and predictable jurisdictions are more important now than ever? And will the pandemic change how EMX acquires new assets? Well, it's interesting you brought that up. And this goes back to the early days of starting EMX Royalty Corporation and discussions with Rick Rule, who was a founding shareholder and helped us get going in the early days as a prospect generator. We oftentimes had this discussion. 
uh, generally speaking, big picture, I believe that political risk is fully, if not overvalued, because we read about it every day in the papers. Mm -hmm. And other types of risks, and there's a whole multitude of them, but let's just collectively call a lot of them technical risk, are typically under understood and typically not well valued in the marketplace. And so there can be a significant inefficiency there. So we've always had the viewpoint that we're willing to go to places that other folks may not be willing to go mm -hmm. to take advantage of that inefficiency. All that being said, we love working in Fennoscandia. We think it's a fan fantastic place to work and we love working in the Western United States and Western Canada or in Canada in general. They're great places to work. So, um, you know, it's a balancing act of understanding geologic potential with all the other various risk factors. Right. What about Davey, as you call him, court your attention as a CEO worth your investment? Well, uh, Dave first came to my attention as a consequence of a very bright geologist that he had worked for named Borden Putnam. I was looking to hire somebody who would be a geologist and go to work for me. And I approached Davey, and he had the good sense to refuse my offer, uh, which caused me to know how much wisdom he actually had. Uh, although I wasn't able to hire him, and by the way, this has happened to me many times, uh, I was able to convince him to go to work for uh, a company that I had funded to start with another geologist who, for various reasons, couldn't follow through. So I've known... Uh, Dave, figuratively, since he was in diapers, of course, he wasn't actually in diapers, but he was a very young geologist. He had uh, superb technical skills, uh, which were acknowledged by people who I knew uh, and whom I knew had good judges of people with technical skills. But Dave had great communication skills, too, as a wet behind the ears Newmont geologist. Uh, he just knocked me out with his presentation. And I said, uh, you know, Dave, you're a natural promoter, but you've never promoted. And I'll never forget this, Dave. You might not remember this. But you said, if you propose and defend a budget in front of the board at Newmont, you are promoting. Uh, you may not be promoting Moz and Paws, but you are absolutely promoting. The guy who puts his presentation out the best and defends it the best with the best information and the best uh, technical skills is the person who wins. Uh, and I think it was that realization that caused me initially to bet on Dave. Uh, the next thing that happened is that Dave, uh, and by the way, I need to give the disclaimer that this doesn't constitute technical advice. We're having an intellectual discussion around the topic of EMX royalty. Um, but Dave was able to attract and retain and motivate very high quality earth scientists to work with him. Uh, I have been quoted in the past at Cambridge House that uh, EMX uh, had more IQ relative to market cap than any junior on the planet that I was familiar with. Uh, I look forward to meeting the new generation at EMX now that the market cap is higher so that I can refresh that assessment. But I can say that Dave, uh, in addition to having great technical skills and great communication skills, has uh, exhibited over time great people skills. He has not been afraid as a geologist to hire other geologists who say, Dave, you're crazy, you're wrong, this is right. Uh, and he hasn't been so ego driven that he wasn't willing to accept technical judgment from people who he, who he had the good sense to hire which is really commendable uh, and unfortunately extraordinarily rare. So again, back to EMX specifically, Dave, what catalysts can investors expect from EMX this summer? In, in continued deal flow. Mm. And that's been one of our, our hallmarks. Um, everybody can be, lots of folks can be prospect generators and acquire assets and talk about how good they are. The rubber meets the road when you get them sold. And in our case, because we're royalty generators, we're selling those projects and always keeping a royalty. And what we have shown year after year, market cycle after market cycle, is that we sell quality 
projects to an industry hungry for new discovery opportunities and keep more and more and more royalties. We believe you cannot own enough mineral rights. You cannot own enough royalties. We want to be exposed to as many as possible. We believe the most astute allocation of capital is the organic growth of royalties through the execution of the royalty generation business model. So that's kind of a long-winded answer, but you're going to see more deal flow. And of course, gold is in vogue right now. We have a lot of gold properties in the portfolio. We've just recently sold some for royalties and other payments, and you're going to see more being sold um, as we move forward. Additionally, we also buy royalties to augment our portfolio. And this is one of the cool and very key things about EMX is the integration between organic royalty growth through royalty generation in addition to buying royalties. And there's significant team synergy there with respect to those entrepreneurial economic geologists out in the world doing the organic growth, identifying key royalties that can be purchased. I'll say right up front, buying royalties is a tough business. Everybody knows what phenomenal financial instruments they are. They trade at a premium. And we are value guys. Our DNA is value in, quite honestly, a momentum world. And so sometimes that's difficult for us because it's, it's hard to find substantial royalties to buy because in our view, they just trade at valuations that don't make sense. Mm. It absolutely makes sense to grow them organically. That's astute allocation of capital. But occasionally we find royalties and royalty portfolios that we believe is distinctly accretive and astute allocation. And we do buy those. And you'll see a combination of organic growth and acquisition growth as we work our way through the summer. Excellent, looking forward to it. And Rick, I've heard you say many times, even earlier today, uh, that when you're investing in a company, you're helping that company answer an unanswered question. So perhaps I can hand the reins to you and you can educate investors what sort of questions they should be asking EMX before they invest. Sure, uh, and I need to disclaim that uh, E EMX is a particular kind of company uh, so that some of the questions will inure easily to Dave's benefit, uh, but others are probably more appropriate to companies that are single asset focused companies. Mm -hmm. Dave has wisely said in the prospect generator and royalty business deal flow is what you want. What he didn't say, and I'm sorry for the pontification, but it uh, is necessary for what follows. Uh, what Dave forgot to say is that he has focused for 20 years on uh, accretive transactions, which is to say transactions that increase the per share value. I got four congratulatory emails today, self-congratulatory emails today, from companies that completed very large financings, which is to say that they diluted the existing shareholders. And they thought this was a wonderful thing. Dave has been able to grow the company with minimal dilution. I suspect, although I don't know, that the company has as much money in the treasury today as they have raised from investors over the last 25 years, which is to say all the money that they have ever raised, despite paying themselves living salaries, they still have. And the growth of the company has come as a consequence of the contribution of intellectual capital. It's important to understand that. The first question that I always ask companies before I ask them what the unanswered question is, is I say, what is your company worth? If you had to break it up today and sell it on the market, if you had to liquidate your assets to a willing buyer and seller, what would you get? For most exploration companies, the answer to that is seven tenths of nothing. <laughs> right? I mean, what they have is a bunch of assets that are reasonably the opportunity to spend money, which is to say liabilities, and they have no assets. Dave has the advantage, when I ask them that question, uh, of pointing to recent royalty transactions and the cash in the treasury. Uh, so it's an unfair question because he gets to say yes, while most guys have to say no, they don't have any assets. The important question that I would ask Dave is what do you think in the next one to two years will be your competitive advantage over the other smart prospect generators, the other smart explorers. How are you going to compete with Sandstorm, with Altius, with Robert Beatty, with Robert Friedland? Uh, what's the secret sauce inside EMX that's going to allow you, first of all, to have the intellectual capital to generate 
where those guys aren't before they get there. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm trying to say, Dave? I do. Uh, yeah, and I know the answer. Great, let's have it. <laughs> our, alpha, our alpha is economic geologic talent, mm -hmm. and that is integrated with and, and self-grown within an entrepreneurial spirit and business acumen. And we have a saying here that astute business decisions are rooted in solid technical understanding. It's key to understand the technicals before you invest. And we've always led with technicals and that the business decisions fall in place based upon what those technicals are telling us. And that sounds very simplistic and you would think most people do that. But again and again and again in my career, I've seen the finance guys go to the geologists and the engineers and say, we've made this decision. Tell us why we're smart. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that with, with catastrophic uh, uh, <laughs> consequences. So, um, you know, it, 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 you know, our, our alpha in the past has been economic geology. It will continue to be. Um, and we always tweak and refine our model based upon the uh, aspects of the capital markets at any given time. Uh, but uh, uh, we're, we're, we, we have a model we love. We're going to keep doing it. Well, I think what would be useful for your listeners, uh, rather than delve exclusively in the future, is to look at some of the successes in the past and how they occurred. Uh, Dave, in addition to being a prospect generator, maybe as a consequence of being a prospect generator, these current assets that you enjoy largely have come about as a consequence of transactions. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could tell us historically about the uranium transaction and then the Russian transaction. Yeah, I'm happy to. How, how you, you know, made money, or rather you built your treasury, not by telling lies to widows and orphans uh, on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, but rather by turning dimes into dollars. Talk about how you did that. I'd be happy to. And this really boils back to our, our unique business model, Rick, as you know. So our bread and butter is what we've been talking about, and that is royalty growth through, through royalty generation. But the same team of economic geologists throughout around the world doing that also identify royalties to be purchased occasionally that fit our valuation criteria. And they also occasionally identify strategic investment opportunities. And our criteria, to, our criteria to make a strategic investment is it has to be so good that you cannot not do it. <laughs> and so we have a very high filter. And consequently, in our 17-year history as a public company, and even further back, uh, if you look at our, our private history, so over a couple of decades now, um, our, our track record for our strategic investing for invested capital is 40% internal rate of return after tax. It's just been absolutely fantastic. Now, we've been able to leverage our invested capital with intellectual talent in many of those cases to help enhance the return. But Rick brings up a couple of key examples, one being our uranium example early in the history of the company. Um, I spent some time in Vienna at the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency and had an awakening with respect to future supply demand fundamentals for uranium and realized that we need to get in the uranium business. That was when the price was seven bucks a pound for yellow cake. And, and we thought that uh, based upon our great intelligence that the price might go to 30, uh, we were entirely wrong. It went to 130. And that investment, that investment worked out very, very well and put us in a situation where when we liquidated that investment, um, which was a seed investment into a company that went forth to pursue the acquisition of uranium assets in North America. That did very, very well, went on to become an $18 stock, uh, was ultimately sold for $1.8 billion. And the money that EMX made out of that put us in a position similar to where we are today, where we had more than all the money we'd raised in the history of the company in the bank. In addition to all the assets that we'd grown through royalty generation and um, at royalty acquisition. So we've done this a couple of different times. A recent uh, um, example is uh, our investment in IG Copper, which was advancing a copper project in south, far southeastern Russia called Malmish, turned into a belt scale discovery. We uh, contributed intellectually as well as financially to the advancement of that project and ultimately was sold to Russian Copper Corporation, setting a record for one of the largest transactions where 100% foreign owned asset was sold to 100% Russian company in Russia in the mining business. And uh, EMX, uh, sure, uh, EMX uh, Corporation netted out $69 million out of that investment at the end of 2018, once again, giving us a strong treasury. 
And that gives us more arrows in the quiver to be able to further execute our three-pronged approach of royalty generation, royalty acquisition, and strategic investing. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you both so much for joining me. It was a real pleasure to chat to you. David, where can our viewers learn more about EMX Royalty Corp? If you could share websites, social, tickers, all of that. Ticker symbol EMX on the New York Stock Exchange, ticker symbol EMX on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Most of our volume these days is in New York, but stock is trading nicely in Toronto. EMXRoyaltyCorp.com is our website. There's a plethora of information there. All the contact information for Isabel Belger, our top-notch investor relations representative in the European theater, and Scott Close, our investor relations director here in the United States. Great folks to contact there, and they're more than happy to put you in contact with other folks within the company if you have some piercing questions. Wonderful, you guys really are a great team. And Rick, where can viewers follow along with you in the near future? I'm gonna give them an incentive, Georgia, as I always do. Great. Uh, I would like to make an offer to Cambridge listeners and subscribers to rank their natural resource portfolios, including EMX royalty. If you will go to SprottUSA.com front slash rankings and enter your natural resource stocks, I will personally rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I will add comments where I think my comments are appropriate. Dave, you'll be happy to see the comments associated with EMX royalty. In addition to that, and by the way, there's no obligation for this. You don't need to be a Sprott client, although you should be. Um, in addition to that, I will include in the return email uh, two special visual aids. One, the Barron's Gold Mining Index of uh, gold equities going back 45 years. It's a wonderful illustrative tool to understand where we are in the gold equities market, particularly in the historical context. And finally, a 100-year commodity chart, uh, which will put the rest of the industrial materials and the values offered by them in the historical context. Once again, that's SprottUSA.com front slash rankings. By the way, be patient. Uh, I've ranked 8,500 portfolios so far. Uh, I understand I'm 1,200 behind. So if you don't get a response for three weeks, please be patient. What a generous offer. Thank you so much uh, to you both. Simply thank you for doing this, Georgia. It's been fun. Thank you for being prepared and thank you for uh, leading the process. Georgia, okay. thank you very much. Great to be here. Rick Rule, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit like and subscribe to our channel. You can follow us at Cambridge on Twitter. And if you click the link in the pinned comment below, you can receive our weekly newsletter. Bye for now.